Welcome to the Sarah Andreco Show. So, okay, Hannah, thank you so much for joining me. I am really interested and looking forward to taking a very deep dive into canine arthritis management. Um, and I think it's a very niche subject, but having somebody such as yourself that spends so much time on this one particular area. Obviously, you can provide a ton of valuable information because that's your expertise. So Please. I definitely want to talk, um, hopefully, <laughs> I'm pretty confident that, that you'll provide some pretty valuable insight to arthritis. Um, but I would love to touch on things like, you know, populations that are most at risk if we're looking at breed factors, early identification, and just really tap into some of your knowledge to help veterinary professionals really help their pet parents through um, arthritis and dealing with that and what that really looks like and some of the common misconceptions surrounding arthritis as well. So one of the things I wanted to start with is CAM. So you started CAM for a very specific purpose. So if you wouldn't mind, just tell me a little bit about that, what it is, and um, kind of what led you to kind of begin that process. Okay. Um, there wasn't one thing that was the, the final trigger. There was a culmination of events that happened that just made me feel something needed to change. And I could have gone down different routes to get there, but because I'm quite impatient and stubborn, I was like, no, I'm just gonna do it on my own. So um, I had been a vet for about 15 years by that point, 14, 15 years. And I'd worked in many, many practices because I'm quite um, flitty. I have been described as flitty in that I, move around the country, do lots of locoming. So I had a really good understanding of the level of attention to chronic pain in many, many practices around the UK. And then with that and having a bit of an epiphany about, this is the most common thing that I'm putting to sleep. You know, this is the most common reason that I'm letting these dogs go. Hmm. We're not doing very much about it. And it's a really, really big factor for elective euthanasia. Then I developed a pain problem myself. So I was at work seeing these dogs being put to sleep because of pain. I had pain. I'd been working in lots of places going, hmm, no one's really caught on to this. And then my dog also got arthritis. And all of these things were kind of like coming in at the same time. And it just started making me think about it differently. And I ended up doing an extra course. Um, us vet professionals are always doing further qualifications. And I, um, I chose a different pathway. I went a little bit off, off the beaten track and I did something called Garland Meyer therapy, which is a manual therapy course. And I learned so much from a paraprofessional that I was like, whoa, there is so much more to know about chronic pain, behavioral expression, postural expression, etc. that I wanted my colleagues to also know about it. So that came in as well. And then finally, the, the final kick for me was I lost a very dear friend to chronic pain and she chose to take her own life. And for me, I, everything came together at that moment, made me think, right, we really need to be doing more about this. And as I said, I'm quite stubborn and I'm, I'm, I'm quite impetuous. So I, um, I started a Facebook page, I wrote a website, I was running a mobile clinic and just trying to share my knowledge that I was learning in the field with an audience that were interested. I love my profession, don't get me wrong, I love my profession, but the audience wasn't really within my profession initially. It was definitely within the public. The public wanted to know this content. And with time, I think the profession has, um, lots of people been having their own journeys, but they've come together now and we're seeing some huge changes with regards to chronic pain management, rehabilitation, et cetera, in this field. But back a few years ago, I definitely felt the people that wanted to know about it were the owners. So that's where my focus was, was owner education. And that's how GAM started. Yeah. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head because it's the owners that are dealing with this, this chronic pain and the issues because of the pain on a daily basis. So in the veterinary setting, you know, you have clients that are coming in here and there, you know, sporadically littered in between the puppy and kitten visits and, you know, the GI visits and everything else. So it's not as in your face as it is for these pet parents that are struggling with this on a daily basis with their pets every single day. So um, I'm really glad that that resource is out there. 
<clears throat> and often it does. It stems from a problem coming from the client side to really get things going and open up the eyes to the veterinary staff, the clinical staff, that something really needs to be done about this and, and be changed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think it's really interesting. Like um, people keep saying to me, are you not bored of it yet? I'm like, oh my God, you have no idea. Every time you start feeling that you know something a little bit better, it opens another five doors of things that you don't know. And communication and owner psychology and colleague psychology and trying to bring together a multidisciplinary team with the same goals and great communication skills is something that I'm beginning to get more and more interested in because we're making leaps and bounds with our interventions. Our chronic pain interventionary tools is expanding dramatically. But the owner education and the owner and um, getting them to be adherent to treatment plans and how to communicate the importance of the multimodal approach, that's challenging, you know, and getting your colleagues to be on board with that same plan because there's so many different things you're doing at once to try and help that owner and their dog that i find fascinating i you know it's 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 not going to get boring it's not going to get boring. <laughs> no. well and that education piece is a skill in itself trying to convey the importance of a treatment plan to a client why you're actually doing this rather than just Here's step one, step two, step three, and step four. It's important that you do these, but explaining why each portion of a, a given treatment plan is is critical for the progress or seeing seeing progress in um, reducing pain and inflammation in an animal with arthritis. So I think education is a skill set when it comes to clients all on its own. Oh, it really is. And you have to also remember that they don't see what you see. And I can see that a dog is improving or deteriorating, but they quite often don't see what I see. So you actually have to spend a lot of time making sure that as a collective, you're monitoring the same things. And if they don't see what you see, you've got to try and help them see it so that they too can monitor it because they're with their pet the whole time. So a, a classic one for me is that people expect when their dog's pain state is reduced that they're going to naturally have improved physical capabilities. So the dog will jump back on the sofa. It will be able to jump into the back of the car. But two two points here. A, we don't want them to be doing that because that is actually going to get to the problem. And B, they probably can't do that. And they actually are improving, but they're improving because they feel better and they, they're more engaged and they're more social, but they still haven't got the strength and the capability to jump on the sofa. But many owners will go, well, it's failed. It's not working. I'm not going to pay for these pills. I'm not going to give this medication because it's not working. But that owner's expectations weren't managed at the beginning. And that's something that we really need to be aware of is that these diseases, by the time we see them, they're so ingrained. They've been present for so long. You can't just switch them off. It's going to take time and it's going to take rehab. and It's going to take behavioral modification for you to undo what has been done because it's taken years to get there. So, um, yeah, owner expectations, management, education, hugely important. Well, I think one of the topics that gets glazed over sometimes is just stoicism. You know, uh, uh, animals are, are kind of have that built in survivability to where they're not showing pain until it's really, really bad. Now, obviously not all dogs are like that, but is that something that you touch on a good bit as far as really encouraging other veterinary professionals to talk about what the owner isn't seeing what's going on on the inside that there are simple, subtle signs and indicators that your dog is suffering, but you might not be as aware of it because, you know, it's, it's more difficult for us to pick up on just based on the stoic nature of animals in general. Yeah, the, the copers. It's really interesting this because like, I'm not a behaviorist. Um, I'm not an ethologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I, so I'll probably put my foot right in the big hole of no-no now, but Everybody talks about dogs being very stoic because of this prey model. You know, they, they don't want to show themselves as vulnerable. And I'm sitting there going, is it just because they don't think that there's another option? Is it not just that simple that they're coping because they don't believe that there's choice? You know, they're not going to go, oh, I've got a bad back. I'm going to pop down to boots and I'm going to get some paracetamol and I'm just going to self-medicate and make myself feel better. They're going to go, that hurts moving like that. So I'm just going to move like this. Brilliant. I can carry on doing what I need to do to, to kind of have a reasonable quality of life and access the resources that I need to make myself content. And um, so when people start going, oh, it's very, very species, and blah, I'm like, no, they're just really good at coping. <laughs> so try and keep it really, really simple for my owners. I'm like, 
he's not telling you because he doesn't know that you're going to be able to fix it. So you've got to look at what he's doing to cope. Let's look at his coping strategies and let's look at ones that are likely to unfold with ease and they're going to be our chronic pain indicators. We're not going to expect a dog that's had significant arthritis for the last five to seven years. They've got no muscle mass left. They're poorly coordinated. They've got no flexibility to suddenly be able to springboard back onto the sofa. But we will expect them, hopefully, to be more engaged with your touch, with your communication. They might just become a little bit more sociable. That's going to be worth monitoring. And then we're going to build towards these capability changes. So, yeah, I think they cope. <laughs> That's a, a beautiful way to put it. I've never actually considered that. But what other option do you have, you know, at, for, coming from an animal's perspective? And you're right. They have no idea what you as a human are going to do about it. So, yeah, that's 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 really excellent. Um, I love the way that you put that coping mechanisms for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it gives us so much more empathy as well, because at the end of the day, like my dog's on feet at the moment. She's um she's having a lady time. She's in season and she doesn't really know what to do with it. She's extraordinarily needy and sitting on my feet. And um, they you just have so much empathy for them when you know that they're doing everything they can to just cope. They just cope. And I find that's really helpful when I'm talking to clients because it, it encourages them to engage and see things from their perspective. What would you do if you didn't have a choice, but you were just coping? Oh, I get it now. Yeah, I am going to change the way I do things and I am going to modify my behavior and I am going to modify my posture. I just think it changes things a little bit. It makes it easy for the owner to understand. And so what about when dogs aren't coping so well? You know, what are some of the signs there? I mean, I come from a behavior field, so I can talk about all the types of different aggressive tendencies that will arise. But then there's also that looming sense of depression or giving in or giving up. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you see in particular when a dog isn't coping particularly well that a professional really needs to take note of and documenting some of these things as far as progress through treatment to say, wait a minute, we might need to do something a little bit differently. Yeah. So I, again, try and keep things really simple. So we talk about something called the CAM factor. And the CAM factor is because of the X factor where everybody goes around with hands like this, but we have it that way. And the CAM factor divides our um, visual cues into behavior change, posture change, physical changes, such as coat changes, muscle changes, etc and capability and gait changes. And so I, I divide them into those categories for me to be able to break down what I'm seeing in front of me. So when you say that they're starting to lose their, their ability to cope, is it they're not coping behaviorally? Is their posture just so so rigid, so uncomfortable that their, their mobility is affected? Is it because um, have they lost muscle mass and weakness that they've got no strength left, so they've got physical changes? Or are they just are not able to compete those activities of daily living where are they not coping so that's one way that my brain works it's not the right way it's just the way my brain works but if you're talking from a behavioral aspect of not being able to cope anymore some so as you say you've got the extremes of behavior so the dog that finally goes i don't want you near me anymore just leave me alone and that can be quite an aversive type behavioral approach but you've also got the, the really stoic dogs that just go, I just don't want to be near anybody anymore. I'm going to segregate myself away. I don't want to engage with you because I don't know if you might hurt me. So you've got those complete extremes. And whenever you speak to um, a specialist, they always talk to you about change. So there's not one area that you can go that's pathonomically linked to pain. You know, that is always the case. It's more about has there been a dramatic change and what is that change? comparative to before um so saying that there is one set thing that i go oh my god we're at the end he's no longer able to cope i don't think that's possible divide it into four where are we not coping and it's more about a, a dramatic change rather than a set specific item if that makes any sense yeah absolutely and i think um you know, it, it, having those different categories like that and not just seeing it as one specific thing, as in this animal is not coping, but being more specific can really help down the road. So if you're seeing a client that has um, is, is being seen for pain or inflammation and you start a treatment protocol for arthritis, having that baseline in medical notes to say, here are the areas that this animal is not currently coping well with, or here are the issues that we're seeing so that in each of those categories, you can actually track 
you know, through your medical records, through the progress of that animal, what's actually working, what's not, where you need to tweak things. Um, so I think, you know, I, I always go back to taking really, really good medical notes so that you can physically see and share with the owner, the pet parent, what, yeah. what's actually working and what's not, or where those adjustments need yeah. to be. Yeah, I think, I think one area that really is lacking, and I think it is because of education and it's because of time and the veterinary consult structure, is that really important um, time with the owner talking about what you're going to see with your dog. Because a lot of owners aren't equipped to identify and then monitor. This is a disease that you have to monitor. It's not going to be a one-stop fix. You're not going to say, right, here's your drugs, that's it, you're sorted for life now. It's always changing. And giving them the tools and the capabilities of being able to divide their dog into those categories so that they can create their, their monitoring tools, which does actually have a technical term. It's called Client Specific Outcome Measures, CSOMs. And um, it's from Duncan Lascelles and his team over in the US. It's been validated in cats. It's a, a more State. of a... Oh. Huh? From NC Sorry. State? Yes. Exactly. I believe uh, Duncan Lascelles is at NC State. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's a cool guy. He's a very cool guy. And what they use is they use three different owner observed likely behavior change so that they can and then they time it so it's a specific like time in the day a specific context and they're looking for change in that um and i think that's really quite a useful tool for owners to use there are others so there's the canine brief pain index and um, inventory there's the helsinki chronic pain index and there's the liverpool osteoarthritis and dog study which are all questionnaire based but one of the beauties about CSOMs is that it's very specific for the owner. So it can be sensitive to those subtle changes. And putting that into context, I was treating a, a couple of dogs recently that when we were using the questionnaire based tools, they really didn't change very much. And they didn't demonstrate how sore the dog actually was because it was more soft tissue myofascial type problems. But when we use the CSOMs and we could actually pick out what the owner was seeing that was showing me that the dog was uncomfortable, it was much more specific. The client-specific outcome measures are very, very useful. And I think they should be prioritized because the owner is in charge of that case. And it might be two years, five years, 10 years, 12 years that they are the person coming to the vet or the therapist or the behaviorist and saying, this is what I've seen has changed. I feel that we're deteriorating or I feel that we're improving. But this is what my facts to consolidate that is. So I, I really feel it's quite important that we spend a lot more time teaching owners to be able to understand and feel empowered to use these measures. Because so many owners will come to me and go, well, he does this, but I, it's, it's not important, is it? It's not important. That's just aging, isn't it? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's hugely important. That's really great. What else do you see? Let's write these down. Let's monitor these. Because then we can actually start them on meds, stop their meds, start them on rehab, change their rehab, introduce therapeutic exercise, modify their plan. The owner and their ability to tell you how we're progressing is so important. Well, I love that that really makes the owner feel like a part of the process as well. They're, they're a part of the team plan to help their dog. They're not you know, necessarily in the dark by being, you know, given a bunch of medical terms and a plan that says do this, this, and this. They're a part of that process and tweaking that process is needed along the way based on their very important, very critical feedback about their own dog. And so it kind of gives them a sense of ownership too, to be a part of that process. And I think compliance would certainly be higher with, with a method like that. Yeah, no, definitely. So um... I was lucky enough to do a lecture recently about like adherence to treatment plans, compliance with treatment plans and concordance with treatment plans and definitely concordance where the owner gets to influence the plan. Their, their observations, their ideas, their strategies, weaving them into your plan is going to improve the outcomes because that person's inspired and empowered to engage and, and persist. So I think um, it's, a, it's a really important factor, but unfortunately the current systems that we have means that there isn't the time allocated to it. And that's why I hope that CAM is going to support vets in this area. So we don't plan to ever kind of stand on toes, never ever um, 
taking the responsibility away from the vets. They are the key professional. They are the person that's diagnosing and prescribing. But what I hope CAM can do is help them by being available 24-7, 365 days a year for the owner to educate and empower themselves to become part of the treatment plan. That's the idea. Yeah, I love that because that also kind of takes away that sense of helplessness as an owner. You know, you're not medically trained. You don't necessarily know what to do. And that can be very empowering and really help alleviate some of that, you know, despair. Like, I don't know what to do for my animal and I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a part of this process. I think the more education for pet parents, the better. But yes, you're right. Ultimately, it is, you know, the veterinarian that's overseeing that and helping them understand that as well. That's where they come in to help and their medical experience helps with that. So in client education too, do you often discuss the other um, systems that are affected? You know, what else happens in the body aside from just the pain and inflammation that you see kind of on the surface? What, what type of education do you think is important for, for clients from that perspective? Um, I think an absolute foundational understanding is that you dogs don't get one disease at a time it isn't like um all right well he's got arthritis so he's never going to get anything else because you know his body's busy with arthritis and fate would never let him have two things at once that really doesn't happen unfortunately we do get dogs that have um, comorbidities that aren't interlinked at all so you might have a dog that is cushingoid and arthritic and they're not actually connected, but now that they have both of them together at the same time, they do conflict in their interventions, so the medications and the approaches needed. And when one's starting to deteriorate, the other one will be dragged with it. So you can have situations where they didn't arrive together, they haven't caused each other, but they're intertwined moving forward. But then you can have situations where you've got a, say, a pain component. So you've got developmental joint disease, that has now become um, arthritis, which is a source of chronic pain. And now we've got behavioral issues that are learnt, solidly ingrained, that need to be addressed. We've got emotional and um, cognitive effects because of their pain state that they've been living with. They've also started to chew or lick because they've got maybe pins and needles or discomfort or referred pain. So they're starting to create dermatological problems. Or you've got a dog that's really uncomfortable holding a squatting position. So actually chooses not to urinate or defecate for as long as possible and they've created secondary problems because of that so yes you can have a direct cause you can have them arrive at the same time and interact with each other so unfortunately there is that that wish you'd only get one thing at one point and you only need to manage one thing at a time but it doesn't work out like that yeah, unfortunately not. That would be great if you only had one problem to deal with at a time. But often you, yeah, you do see that these things are completely intertwined. And, you know, unfortunately, one exacerbates the other based on having two things happening at once. But I, um, yeah, I just think it's important to know that that those things can occur simultaneously and they can worsen, you know, worsen each other's symptoms, so to speak. Yeah, I've got so much respect. Like for the owners, some of the owners on um, Holly's Army. So we have a community group called Holly's Army. And that's because when the CAM Facebook page was kind of really taking off, we found loads of people were writing to us on that page, wanting to tell us their story, wanting us to listen. They just wanted to be listened to. And they felt that they were in their tribe. They, they'd found the people that were going to be supportive to them. And we're like, oh, my God what do we do with all these people? So we're like, okay, we're going to create a community group where you can all support each other. So we can tip, dip in, we can guide, we can advise, we can lead, but you're going to be able to take your learning and help the next person. So like a pyramid sales type thing. I We teach you, you teach them, they teach them. Brilliant. We can have a manageable system. So Holly's Army kind of developed. And at first, I really believed it was going to be owners with aged arthritic dogs. And I thought it was going to be very much for palliative emotional support. But the people that were populating this group were the owners of young dogs. So these dogs are 18 months, two years, and they'd been diagnosed with elbow dysplasia. They'd been diagnosed with, you know, lumbosacral stenosis. And they had 10, 12 years ahead of them to manage this disease. And they were exhausted already. And um, so listening to them, you're like, oh, my God, this problem is massive. So right at the beginning of this interview, you said to me, oh, you've got a very niche area. And I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> this is huge. 
Because chronic pain is a disease that affects all age groups. And it's a developmental disease, arthritis, that is secondary. The most common cause of arthritic change is abnormal joint structure. That happens during their development. These dogs at the age of one, two years old have full blown arthritis. But we just do this poster boy of the black fat lab that's 10 years old as thinking that's the arthritic dog. It's not, you know, we've got a huge population. But the point of my little round boys within Holly's army, the owners that are in there uh, often have dogs with three or four conditions. So they might have inflammatory bowel disease, Cushing's arthritis and you're like oh my god and you are managing three chunky diseases that all overlap each other and these people are incredible incredibly devoted to their dogs they will pursue any means to make their dog comfortable for as long as possible but you can see that it is seriously having quite a knock-on effect on their own ability to cope so we did a post recently about caregiver burden and me and Gwen Covey Crump had a, a chat last week and it just snowballed on Holly's Army where so many people were stepping forth and writing reams about how they felt and how they had struggled. And it was so nice to just know that other people felt the same because it's exhausting looking after a, 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 any, any animal or person long term. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. It is what it is. You are looking after them for the best of the, again, give them the best quality of life for as long as possible. It's exhausting. So there you go. My ramble. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And I think it, it's so important for people to understand that they're not alone. You know, quite often, if you're not involved in a community like that, you feel very isolated in the issue that you're dealing with. And not that you want other people to be suffering too, but it does help you to understand that you're not alone in this and that there are other people out there that are going through the same thing that can potentially provide advice as to what they've been through and help you through that process more rapidly so that you can feel better about the process as well and not just alone, essentially. Yeah, no, definitely. I think this is a, this is a really heartrending story that I'm going to tell you. It, it, it blew me away. So it was Christmas and I check Holly's army probably about 10, 15 times a day. I'm just permanently checking in. And um, it was Christmas day and this girl had come onto Holly's army to pour her heart out. So she'd been at the family do in the kitchen downstairs and her old dog had fallen on the kitchen floor because they were, um, the rest of the family were encouraging the dog to chase something across the slippery kitchen floor. And she watched her dogs splay. Now she immediately lost the plot, which I know I would do too. I right? just total meltdown. And Christmas day, whole family there, everybody's in their Christmas jumpers, drinking, you know, booze. And they didn't understand how she just exploded because she'd watched her dog really hurt itself. And she ran upstairs and was hiding in her bedroom with her dog, writing on Holly's army, crying her eyes out, just saying, I just need somebody to understand why I did that. And, you know, the flood of love that came from that point of everybody going, I totally get where I'm coming from. I can totally see why you did that. I would have done the same. And she was able to kind of go, OK, I've declunked all of that energy or that emotional stress. I can go back down now and I can converse why I did what I did. But I think people forget how hard it is managing yourself when the thing that you love the most, your absolute treasured possession, is suffering. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very hard to go th a thing to go through and witness for sure. And so that really takes a toll on a pet owner and, and remembering to actually take care of yourself and, and having that reminder, whether it's from a veterinary professional or a friend or a community like that, to say, hey, you got to take a minute for yourself as well. Get out what you need to get out and make sure you're taking care of you because you, you can't take care of anything else if you're not taking care of you too. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to watch people go through that because they have that just incredible empathy for their pet as well, their dog as well, their companion. And it's, it's very painful and that requires, that requires some, some human work too, <laughs> for sure. It really does. I think this is a de developing um, field. I'm, I'm very fascinated now about that area of chronic support. So not just chronic disease, because with chronic disease, you need chronic support. And um, 
at the moment, the vet profession, we haven't really got that in place. You know, we are beginning to have palliative care and there is more interest in gerontology. So we're getting a little bit more interest in that geriatric medicine where you are juggling comorbidities. But as a owner support for them and what they need, it doesn't exist yet that I found. Please, if anybody is doing it, get in touch because I think it is needed. I, re- I really do. You know, now that I've stepped out of clinical practice and I'm still doing um, clinical work, but I mean that my brain is now very owner focused because of the work online. I just see a massive need for it. Yeah, and hopefully we're headed in the right direction. I mean, for quite some time there, we really needed some end of life care support, some grief support for owners. And now, you know, instead of just it being the end of the line with your veterinary staff after, you know, the needle goes in and you walk out the door, now there is this support system where they're offering you grief support and showing you what to do and how to reach out to other people. And so I imagine that hopefully soon we'll see some of that support system you know, kind of flow into the the end of life stages, at least to where if you're looking at hospice care or just kind of those last few years with management, that there's some, some support there too. So I feel like we're at least headed kind of in the right direction with, you know, starting with that, that um, you know, support, that grief support around um, the last few days, you know, those last few moments and I'm expecting that will filter down. And, and so hopefully if, yeah, if anyone out there that is listening does have resources regarding that, please definitely share that in the comments and get in touch about that so we can share that as definitely. well. Definitely, And also this, um, within the, the canine sector, within the pet sector, there is a um, anticipatory grief. Like I, I had it for years and I just thought I was a wuss, you know, because I would, um, it was six, seven years before Holly even, <laughs> even was close to passing. I would only but think about it and I'd just, I'd, I'd lose it. First in tears, I could be driving my car, it would pop into my brain and I would cry. And um, it, it, it just got worse. It, and I finally decided to talk about it online. I just, I, I wrote a post when Cam was in its infancy wow, it went crazy. There were so many people that had the same but weren't talking about it. And they were, like me, a little bit embarrassed, thinking that they were a bit wussy um, because it hadn't even happened yet. How can you be sad? It hasn't even happened yet, you know? And they were kind of a bit scared to talk about it for people's reaction towards them. So the fact that I just said, look, do you know what? I do something really quite strange. And um, anybody else do this too? There was like 170 replies within three or four hours. And that's when we only had 2,000, 3,000 followers. So it was a really big percentage of our of following. But that just goes to show you that there is a real need to have these things talked about. You know, I, I think we forget how much we invest emotionally and how much we get back emotionally from our pets. Definitely. Yeah. And you're not alone. I, I mean, I, I used to do the exact same thing. I would just be you know, five, six years out from that ever even occurring and just have the thought of it and just completely lose it. So yeah, <laughs> glad I'm not the only one out there doing that. <laughs> I need to join Holly's army as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I do want to ask- You need to join Holly's army. I'm going to, yes, that will be, that's on my list today. I'll be I'll be in that group for sure. Because I, 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 I can see the benefit just in having that community as well. You know, even from a professional's pr- perspective, yeah. we're, we're all involved in this. We all feel the same way. At least people who would join a group like this about the, the companions that we hold closest to us. And I think that's a really helpful resource. So um, you had mentioned too that the, the number one cause of arthritis was abnormal joint structure. So I think there's a lot to be said about how to prevent things like that, but what are some other indicators too that you see being primary factors or markers for dogs that are more prone to having arthritis or developing arthritis? You know, it surprises me what you said about younger dogs exhibiting this. You know, you do, you think about the older Labrador retriever, the golden retriever, the great Dane or something like that, that is more prone to this. But talk to me a little bit about some of the other indicators or factors that you might see that could lead someone to believe that there could be a possibility for their dog in the near future to struggle with some of these issues and maybe have some heads up to that and, and some preparation for that. Okay. Yeah. So 
We definitely know that there's a huge genetic component. So there are breeds that are really predisposed. So your best resource to go to is the Orthopaedic Foundation of Animals, so the OFA.org. And that is an incredible organization. I think it was set up in like 1966 or something like that, where a guy, um, he was one of these um, philanthropists and he had basically a dog that um, was going to be his um, companion, his hunting companion. He got hip dysplasia and he was like, whoa, this is just like, this is a, this is, this is a new dog. This is a young dog. How can this happen? And um, he invested into this organization that has just grown and grown. So it now looks at all breeds and what they're predisposed to. So, for example, from there, you can say the pug is the most common breed to get hip dysplasia. Um, the bulldog is the second most common breed to get hip dysplasia. So you can actually start saying, right, what the, the choice of breeds, what are they likely to get? Because common is common. So that would be a really good starting point is looking there. That then leads on to all the like the canine healthcare schemes. So um, over here in the UK, the Kennel Club does the um, health screening for hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, et cetera. You've got the same over in America, slightly different techniques. But the idea is that you're by looking at the dog's phenotype. So what their hip structure is like or what their elbow structure is like as an adult. So it's done when they're a year old, x-rays are taken. What is their genetic likelihood that they're going to pass those traits on? Um, and so by looking at the parents and looking at the line that that dog is coming from, you can make good decisions about breeding pairs using estimated breeding value and the actual mum and dad's scores, if that makes sense. So you can look at the genetics, you can look at breeding, you can look at breed predisposition. The next big, 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 big one is weight. It's just... <sighs> It's just mind blowing, actually, you know, because let's take emotion out of this. It doesn't make any sense. It's like such a bizarre situation to be in, in that we are killing our dogs with love. That's the end of it. You know, we're feeding them treats and tidbits and overfeeding and under exercising. What are we doing? And it's got to the point that people can't even see that their dogs are overweight because their comparative in the park is also overweight. So we've got to a stage where like, well, my dog's not as fat as that one, so mine's okay. No, wait, well, yeah. that one's a beast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's really think about this. And I just, I find, it, I find it quite interesting because body condition scoring, we can all do it. We can all look and go like chest, abdomen, chest, abdomen. There should be a chest, abdomen. There should be an hourglass figure. This is not hard to achieve. Where are we going wrong with this? But um, it is it's a, it's a massive problem, the, the weight thing. Um, nine out of 10 owners of overweight dogs cannot visually see that their dogs are overweight. So whenever I do any lectures, I try and bring a bit of lighthearted humor and say, right, you're gonna go home, you're gonna pull out your eyeballs, you're gonna plug them back in and you're gonna look at your dog as if you've never seen it before. And you're going to be honest with yourself. So put your dog, Against a little backdrop, take your eyeballs out, put them in, open your eyes. What's your dog look like? You're like oh my God, it's no waistline. Yes, no waistline. So um, I think weight is another thing that we really need to be taking more seriously. We definitely know the young dogs, if they're carrying weight at an early age, they're going to carry it for life. And lots and lots of work has been done at Liverpool University about looking at puppy growth rate and making sure that they fall into like these um, percentiles. So you can track that they're growing to their weight category, their breed weight category, and they're not falling by the wayside, gaining too much weight, too little weight through that growth stages. So weight is another big one. Um, then you start to play in the realms of, do we know much about this yet, but lifestyle? And I'm, I'm a I'm a strong believer that lifestyle's got a big role here, but we haven't got the studies to support the claims yet. So my null hypothesis will be <laughs> slippery floors. I really honestly believe that there is a big problem with how we're bringing these dogs up. Um, we're not just talking about bone development and joint development. These joints develop because of the soft tissue structures around them, the neuromuscular function around them. And if we have got dogs that are getting repetitive strain injuries, 
permanently injuring the soft tissue support, we're going to have abnormal joint structure. It just it's just not possible not to influence it. Um, so I do feel that lifestyle's got a huge role to play here, but we haven't got a huge amount of data to support that yet. That's just from logic. Um, and then from there, I guess things like early veterinary um, intervention and intention. So owners being able to say, okay, my dog's eight months old and I'm seeing an intermittent lameness. I'm seeing a behavior change. I'm seeing something that's not quite right. I need to get this checked out rather than what we're doing at the moment, which is, well, he's only eight months old, so it can't be anything serious. You know, he's, he's brand spanking. And I think there's a real tendency for people to see that their pet is like a toy that's just come out of a little lovely box, cellophane box. It's perfect. It can't be broken. It's brand new. Actually, it can be. And we need to get people to realize that these early clues, yes, it might mean that you go down a pathway that identifies something, but you want to know early, not late. So don't put your head in the sand and think it's going to go away. Get it checked out. So genetics, weight, lifestyle, uh, and making sure you attend to problems earlier rather than later would be kind of like the big four. Do you have any recommendations as far as um, joint supplementation or anything that should be added nutritionally to the diet during that kind of first year of life? I'm generalizing, obviously, based on breed that's different, but during that first year of life to support joints um, in regard to like Obviously, you can do things like not running your dog more than a mile or try to prevent accidents, but anything that sets them up in, in the event that there is an accident or something is overdone, do you often recommend anything like that or just good overall nutrition? There isn't, there really isn't anything out there to support a statement that if you use this supplement, you're going to minimize your dog's opportunity of getting arthritis. That doesn't exist, Okay. Um, there are people that advocate the introduction of things like the glucosamines and the chondroitin sulfates at an earlier point in a dog's life. If they are going to have any benefit, they're definitely only capable of benefiting on a very long term use and introducing quite early with the concept. If there is joint damage, it's before we visualize it. So arthritis is full blown by the time we pick up on the signs. So into introducing these supplements before you've got even a whiff of a problem might, might, but there isn't really anything to strongly support that. The only supplement that is universally agreed to have the potential to influence is the omega-3 fatty acids from a marine-based um, source. So your EPA and DHA um, from a marine-based source. Um, that is something that everybody agrees can influence, influence the inflammatory cascade. And they have got evidence in the brie, in, in the species, strong clinical trials in vivo. Yes, in vivo, in the actual population that we're wanting to see if there's an impact. Whereas the reason I say that really facetiously is a lot of the data that we look at with regards to other supplements isn't a true representation of our audience. You know, looking at what happens in a lab is not what happens in a dog. And looking at an induced arthritis model where you transect the cruciate ligament and then you make that dog run on a treadmill until they set up quite a beastly arthritis within the next three to four weeks is not what we see. We see something that's taken years to develop. So when you start kind of like really looking at the data and going, is that really what we see? No, it's more. So um, I get I get a little bit ranty about supplements, partly because I'm so on the owner's side. I'm I'm a hundred percent owner and dog um, supporter, and I feel that there's a lot of people out there really manipulating the vulnerable. Um, in the human world, we know that we're stepping away from supplements. We know that there's a lot of very poor. Um, quality products out there that are very well marketed and actually if we look at core principles about keeping moving keep your weight under control have a healthy lifestyle if you fulfill that you shouldn't need to be bunging loads more in your body and I think that's a, a very similar situation if we've got dogs that are the right body condition score they're getting routine amounts of exercise that fulfill their needs do we need to keep supplementing we shouldn't need to yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, if, if you think about the term supplement in general, it's it's meant to fill the need of a deficiency, right? So it's yes. not meant to be on top of everything else necessarily. I love the fact that you said that because I was in, I was paddleboarding with my dog one day and it was like an epiphany out at sea. And I was like, supplement, supplement, 
supplement. That means to supplement. That means doesn't to fix. That doesn't say I'm the fixer. It isn't I am the holy grail. It means I suck. <laughs> so when you take that in mind, you kind of think, right, what's core? Now, I'm the core. The core is weight control. I am the core is early identification. Um, I just wish people would know that because I, I do feel that when something is hurting in front of you, you will do anything to make it better. And often that means that we get out our iPad and we buy something because we don't know what else to do. Exactly. But I hope that can work. I don't need to buy this. I need to engage with this. And that means I'm going to get a licky mat and I'm going to get my dog up moving. I'm going to start feeding him in a Kong. I'm going to get that weight off. I'm going to start doing some therapeutic exercises. That's going to make some really big differences. But buying a chalk supplement from a brand no one's ever heard of, but it's really, really well marketed and it's everywhere on Facebook is not going to be what makes a difference. I love your suggestions because they support be behavioral health as well. So anytime you can check both boxes with one fell swoop, it, it's, it's definitely in the bonus category for me. Yeah, definitely. And I think we're in the, in the vet world at the moment, there's a lot of people thinking it's a very money driven um, profession. So we were, um, Sadly. just I'd, at the moment, there's something called not one more vet going around. I think everybody should know about this. We have one of the highest suicide rates of all professional industries. And um, we have horrendous mental health issues in our, uh, in our industry. And um, a lot of these um, vets are really expensive. Vets cost the earth, et cetera. It, it, it really hurts because we're all class A personality types that are actually just trying to do the best that we can. So when you get critiqued for something that actually is not in your control, so let's be honest, we have now got a, a corporate structure to, to the vet industry. So here in the UK, 70 to 75% of vets are now a corporate. We're not privately owned anymore. So the vet that you see behind that table, they're on a salary. At the end of the day, they're on a salary. That doesn't change. It isn't affected by their take home. So they are actually every day just trying to do the best job that they can. So talking back about these free interventions, that fulfills everybody's wish because us vets can go, tell you what, you get the weight off your dog, we're gonna come off that medication because we know that weight's gonna have a massive impact on his pain state and progression. And guess what? That's free of charge. How amazing is that? You know, go and buy yourself a five pound licky mat and start using that to get your dog moving and weight shifting and engaged. Guess what? That's almost free of charge. Isn't that great? <laughs> Just like, yes. Exactly. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I try to steer away from comments on Facebook and getting into arguments, but I will tell you that is the one area that I always intervene. I always step up for veterinarians and veterinary staff, supporting staff and professionals, because it nothing nothing hurts more to somebody that got into a business because of their empathy to be basically put down because of it and, and blamed for you know, shortcomings of, of education. You know, it's simply a lack of understanding and ignorance as to as to what these vets have to pay for, what their overhead is, and, and the fact that they are salaried. You know, the majority of veterinarians out there are not making a commission off of selling you that heart room product or, you know, marking up the prescriptions that come out of the hospital to such an exorbitant amount. No, they pay more than Walmart does for that prescription medication. So Yeah, yeah. My brother won't my my brother won't mind me saying this. So my, my brother, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, but I went to university for six years and um, I went at a time where there were bursaries. So I did get supported through some of it with, because my dad was on a low salary. Um, but I still came out with a whopping student loan, which isn't anything compared to what they have now. And my brother, he didn't go to university. He didn't even finish college. Okay? And he was on the same wage as me as a builder. And I was like, wait, <laughs> and um but it's i think there's a real belief that vets earn a fortune and you know most of the people that i know really don't nope they're not in it for that reason that's for sure so yeah we'll keep fighting that good fight at least right, definitely so let's talk a little bit about some of your medical interventions so when you you have a client that comes in and i know you're not as much in clinical practice now, but for other veterinary professionals that are out there, what is kind of your course of action determining what medications you might look at using? What other interventions? Obviously, we talked about weight management, so reducing food and being very specific with clients about how to do that, what foods to use, you know, actually measuring foods, things like that. But as far as a medical intervention side of things, what are some of your go-to plans? 
Okay. First of all, I think we have to really clarify that if somebody's bringing their dog in to see us, that means that the dog's going to be painful. Um, it is very, very rare that an owner is going to come to me and say, I, I think and I fear that my dog is developing arthritis, but it's not clinical yet. So, and the clinical presentation of arthritis is pain. So that is its main clinical problem. If we didn't have pain, it wouldn't be such a problem. So with that in mind, as a veterinary professional, my real focus with intervention is to get the pain under control. And looking at what we have currently available, it is the non-steroidals. So we know with huge amount of evidence to support that, that using an anti-inflammatory is going to get that pain state under control most effectively and safely. So a lot of people go, oh no, but non-steroidals can cause GI problems and it can affect liver and kidney. Well, actually, um, when you look at the evidence, those adverse events are actually pretty damn rare. Um, it is unfortunate, and anybody that's listening that's had an adverse event, I feel really sorry for you. I, honestly, I don't mean that in any way, oh, you know, callous at all. But when you look at how often we use these interventions, thousands and thousands of times a day, the actual adverse event rate is quite low. A lot of these dogs that do have adverse events, quite often they've already got a clinical issue that is just brought to the surface. So these dogs that might have a raise in kidney values or liver parameters, there could be, and there is likely to be something that was already in place and you know, boiling underneath the surface. So um, I am a big fan of non steroids because I think they do what they say they're gonna do. And I am also a fan at trying to get the dog off of the non steroidals. So I always say that because there's a real belief that once you go on medication, that you're stuck on it. Not necessarily. You know, if you've got a dog that has been brought to me and I've said, you've come to me because you're seeing behavior change, posture change, physical changes, capability and gait changes. We know that this is arthritis because we've localized it. We've got elbows and hips affected. We know the chief clinical sign is going to be pain. My best tool for you is going to be to start with a non-steroidal. And then hopefully over time with the weight loss, with the lifestyle change, with the introduction of maybe therapeutic exercises, hydrotherapy, hopefully we're going to be able to wean you off this medication because you shouldn't need it anymore. So I do use non -steroidals. I find that it ticks everybody's boxes. Um, we've got a new medication out here in the UK, which is really exciting. We've got a monoclonal antibody called Labrella, which is just out. And it seems to be creating quite some big waves. We've got Piprant, which have been around for a while, which is like a cousin of an anti-inflammatory, but much further down the inflammatory cascade. So much more targeted in its effect. So those are the kind of first line interventions that we as veterinary professionals are seeing alongside the multimodal approach. Um, and what I would hope will happen is that that owner will come back, keep seeing the veterinary professional, keep seeing the therapist, get their dog's life in as good an order as possible, that we can come off of those um, medicinal interventions because they shouldn't need them. That's the idea. Um, and when it comes to choosing your anti-inflammatories, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, do you have specific preferences or is there something that's going to you know, push you in the direction of Rimadol versus Galaprant. Any factors there in particular? No, I think there's definitely a lot of um, theoretical evidence and pharmacy, like the pharmacokinetics of the Galaprant, which is um, Grapiprant, which is the Piprant. Um, when you look at the pharmacodynamics and the, the theory behind that, that would be a first line approach because its side effect profile theoretically is less and it also appears in, in um, real life use to be less. So galliprant would be a really good starting point. But we have um, found within our own population on Holly's Army, a number of dogs that were on a COX-2 specific, such as Onsi or such as Prevacox, and they've gone to Galliprant because of a lower side effect profile after four or five weeks have gone, just not cutting it, I'm going to go back. So um, with regards to which non-steroidal to use in the COX-2 specifics, um, there isn't any evidence to say that one is better than the other. So it's very individualistic. Um, what we should be doing is trying to encourage owners to see benefit in maybe trialing one for a period of time and then having a washout period and trying another one, um, you can certainly do that. Or if you've got a dog that hasn't been doing so well on one, 
then before going, I need to add an adjunct, I need to add something else, I need to do this. Maybe a conversation about trialing a different one would be appropriate. And again, if you've had a dog that has had an adverse reaction to one, you should certainly not say that non-steroidals are off the menu. Um, just because you've had a reaction to one does not mean you're going to have a reaction to any of the others. And what's your typical washout period in between uh, non-steroidals? So again, there is no literature to be specific for this, but most people do about five to seven days. And if you've okay. had an adverse GI reaction, then it makes a lot of sense to go to 10 to 14 to allow GI mucosal recovery. So, um, but that is using a lot of theory. I don't believe that there's been any papers out there to go, that is what you're supposed to do. That's what most people do do, and it seems to work. And what about um, coupling with pain medications in particular, especially when there's a behavior aspect to it? Do you ever see a benefit to doing that, or do you just start primarily with the anti-inflammatory to begin with? Kind of, it totally is case dependent. So, for example, if you were to be looking at a, let's say, a middle aged dog that is got painful hips, but they're engaged, they're bright, they they want to talk to you, but they're just like, oh, just leave my hips alone. Okay, just just not the hips. Okay, you can touch anywhere else, but just leave my hips alone. So they've got a restricted range of motion when you're actually trying to extend them through the hips. They've got some muscle mass loss. They may be just locally sensitive then theory would say a non-steroidal should be your first port of call on its own and let's see how we respond so let's reassess say two to four weeks and see what it has managed to achieve alongside the rest of the multimodal approach but if you had say a german shepherd nine years old drop tail scuffing pads scuffing toenails really quite weak on behind really quite significant behavior change don't touch me just don't touch me anywhere I don't want to sit with you anymore. I am actually quite sore and I'm scared of you making me more sore. Then at that point, you could start saying, have we got a really big neurogenic component of pain? Have we got neuropathic pain here? This makes a lot of sense to start this dog on a non steroidal plus an adjunct because I've got enough evidence in front of me to say a two or three prong approach is the right thing to do for this case. But any intervention has to be monitored because you'll see this on Holly's Army, which is one of the beauties of the group, is that you could take 10 dogs and all put them on the same plan and they're all going to respond differently. So you have to look at what that plan did for that dog. And that might mean that that German shepherd who's gone home on, let's say, Metacam and Gabapentin, the owner reports, this is fine, I think I see improvement, and we start titrating the dose up of the Gabapentin and they continue to see improvement. Or they might say to us, oh, my God, my dog's really quite wobbly. He's really quite lethargic. I'm, don't, I don't feel this gabapentin suits him. And then at that point, we might say, right, OK, gabapentin's not right. Let's try pre gabapentin or let's let's jump over to romantidine. So I think every case is an individual. And I think people need to understand that. Yeah, that's an excellent point to make, for sure, that it's a very individualized approach. And I think we're starting to see that more in every aspect of veterinary medicine. So behavior is an individualized approach, you know, cardiology, individualized approach, patient to patient to patient. And so, yeah, I, I like that you you bring that point up, especially when it comes to pain and or inflammation and dealing with arthritis. Um, and you, t you talk a lot about multimodal approaches. So I, I wanted to just briefly touch on some of the other integrative parts to managing canine arthritis as well. So we looked at hydrotherapy. I mean, there's laser therapy out. What are some of your favorite other integrative um, aspects to use when addressing arthritis? Okay. Um, my favorite are these. I think they are really underutilized. Um, I think they have a physical impact, but I always think they have a huge emotional impact. And I think that that is something where a lot of these hands-off therapies don't have. We all know what it feels like to be touched and suddenly a wave of comfort hit you. You know, even now, if somebody was to put their hand on my shoulder and just kind of you know, say, I'm here, you're like, oh, thank God you're here. So I think um, time, hands, you know, lifestyle changes, interactive feeding, little and often exercise, therapeutic exercises, gold dust and free. Um, we 
other interventions, I think they all have their place. I'm really excited by extracorporeal shockwave therapy. Um, that's where I would like to spend a bit more of my time. So um, the reason that I'm quite interested about it is it is multifunctional. So it's not just articular. It's not just focused on like spinal compromise, but it's also you can do soft tissue. So myofascial trigger points and um, all of this sort of stuff. And for me as a clinician, if I've x-rayed a dog and my, that dog is still sedated, I could actually intervene with something at that point, which is quite interventional. So there's extracorporeal shockwave therapy. Um, Laser is really interesting. And I'm believe it or not, there's not a huge amount of data out about it. Um, in the right hands, I think it can be incredible. I think it can be really good. But I think we've got to be careful that we don't just see it as waving a magic wand and not use it in a specific manner. I think you still need to look at the dog and go, what am I trying to achieve? Where are my sources of discomfort? Am I dealing with compensatory? Am I dealing with soft tissue? Am I dealing with articular? What am I trying to achieve with using this intervention? Um, so what other things have we got? Laser, got that. Hydrotherapy, God, it's amazing. It's incredible. You know, having a dog in warm, buoyant water, you can almost see them smile. They come in and the water's raising up in an underwater treadmill. You can just see them go, this is amazing, thanks. <laughs> so I think hydrotherapy is really, really good to use. I think you've got the free swimming and the underwater treadmill. It's very universal. It's a very flexible tool. I'm getting a little bit into acupuncture. I've um, just started a course with the amazing Sam Lindley from the Western Veterinary Acupuncture Group. And I think there's, um, there's some real, um, it's got good theoretical kind of evidence of why it should work. And they're beginning to get some evidence to support it. But um, what I like about it, it's the same with these hands, is that you get to spend time with the animal and you get to be hands on, you get to be engaged. And I think that's a really important thing. Well, there's, there's loads of other stuff that we do. Intra-articular, going in for the actual joint and problem. So we've got so many different things that we can use now. We've got our hyaluronic acids. We've got our steroids for palliative care, platelet-rich plasma, stem cells. And there's something new on the block over in your neck of the woods. We haven't got it here yet, called Cinevitin OA, which is radioactive tin. So it's a radionuclotide. And what it does is it um, emits um, beta gamma, I think it's beta radiation. I always get it wrong. But it causes the synoviocytes, which is the lining of the joint capsule, so the synovium, that can be quite instrumental in this destructive, this degenerative process, this inflammatory degenerative process. And um, it tends to target them and destroy them. So that is really quite exciting and in clinical trials one intra-articular injection is showing effect for up to a year wow so that's something really new so at the actually at the moment you know it is such an exciting time not only interventionally we've got a lot more tools in our toolbox we've got the marrying up of these disciplines so we're getting behavior coming in with rehab coming in with surgery coming in with internal medicine and then we've got our nurse team who are being promoted to be part of this multidisciplinary support service. Oh my God, that's really cool. Um, and then we've also got really amazing diagnostics coming through. So we haven't just got simple radiography. We've got things like stance analysis, which is no bigger than a weighing platform that you see in your average vets, which can measure weight distribution between the four limbs. We've got gait analysis, force plate analysis. You know, we've got all of these other things coming in to help us get a better diagnosis. So it's pretty exciting, actually. You know, it is sad that we have got such a problem with it from a young age and you know we are going to be hard pushed to avoid it if you own a dog you are going to experience arthritis but i think we're getting in a better and better position year on year of how we can manage it yeah, there are so many options out there i mean half of the things that you just listed off i was like oh oh okay interesting yeah so just adding all of these different things as far as consideration and you know opening some doors to look at different possibilities when it comes to treating arthritis i think it's it, that's really really exciting that so many things exist that we can tap into and try with individual patients to see what works for them and then we can use that data, obviously, from patient to patient to patient. Well, here's what I did with this one, and this worked. Or I tried this new system with this animal, and this didn't work so well, but maybe for this one, it'll be better. But 
just having some information that you can collect from trying some of these different things and kind of, as you said, adding these different tools to the toolbox to really make a difference when it comes to comfort. Um, and as you mentioned before, too, emotional comfort as well, the emotional state of the pet parent that's having to go through this um, and just the, the overall comfort of the animal involved. So, I mean, I think you've definitely opened some eyes as to what some of the possibilities are regarding not only the support system, but the tools. I think this is what makes me laugh is that so many people say to me, seriously, you're, you're still arthritis? Come on, it's been like eight years. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know anything yet. <laughs> it's nuts, you know. It is developing so quickly. And what's really exciting is when I qualified back in 2002, at that point, I, I was working in a, a practice up in Yorkshire. In a consultation, you were expected to not only vaccinate, clip claws, deal with aggression, and, and talk about phantom pregnancy. You know, it's, it's just incredible what was expected to be done. And in the last like 18 years, we've broken away behavior. You know, this is now a discipline that deserves time and it, in, it deserves investment. So we have gone from first opinion practitioners that are always trying to put a plaster over a behavioral problem. We're now actually empowered to say, right, I'm going to get a, a suitably qualified person to come in and talk further about this. They're actually going to come to your home because it needs to be done within context. And it's a long process, guys. So they're going to be with you for two, three hours. It's reports going back and forth. This is something that you really need to invest in. So this is in my lifetime. I see the same happening with chronic pain. You know, there's already people that are running extraordinarily successful pain clinics dealing with chronic pain. And they're busy, very, very busy. And the service that they provide is very bespoke. And it's very much symbiotic to first opinion practice. So it's not that they're taking trade, they're working with the local practices. And I can just see that blossoming and growing and growing. Yeah, I definitely hope so. I mean, if you think about it, pain is one of those things that affects everything. It affects your emotional state, your physical well-being, everything. Yeah. So it is important, I think, to see that as a focus. I would love to see it become its own thing, almost like behavior has, like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've got this daydream. Like, this is my daydream at the moment, <laughs> is that I want to find a um, premises that are out in the country. So it's quite quiet because a lot of these dogs will have nervous disposition. So I want it to be in a nice serene area, but I want it to be surrounded with um, greenery so we can have um, a scent garden, a proprioceptive garden. We can have a way that these dogs, before they come into the clinic, can de-stress and they can be engaged and they can come looking forward to whatever's ahead of them. Um, and then I'd like it to be set out like a home. I'd like the clinic to look like a home so that they're coming into someone's house rather than this stark, white clinical environment. And I just would love to be able to have a room that is almost like a living room and they come in and they can have their treatment in there and it doesn't feel threatening and it's spacious and it it just gives them that feeling of this is going to be okay. I don't need to fear this. And then out the back, you've got your area where you can be doing your you know, diagnostic imaging and your, your inch articulars. But it's all very much thought about maintaining that comfort, calm approach. And I, I yeah, that's my daydream at the moment. That is perfectly beautiful from a behavior perspective. I couldn't love that more. You know, we have we have this shift with cat, with cat friendly practices. You know, separating the canine area and the feline area, and doing fear free things in in the clinic and and all that and truly addressing the stress level of the animal, like having them not be stressed coming in the door by laying it out that way, I think is fantastic. I mean, personally, you were talking about bringing acupuncture in and I had a dog that had severe arthritis that I, I was certain would probably benefit from acupuncture, but just coming into the clinic setting was such a stressor that it, it, it negates all of the work that the acupuncture could potentially do for the animal. So it's, it, it's a wash. But if you have an environment that's inviting, that's more comforting, that kind of chops that stress head, you know, right off at, at the at the get go, then you open the possibility that the therapy you're actually trying to impact the animal with is going to have that intended effect. Yeah, I love Absolutely. that idea. That's beautiful. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, speaking of your wonderful ideas, where can people learn more from you? I, I don't, I'm not sure if you're heading up any conferences or any speaking engagements or sessions this year, but what's the best way for people to kind of follow along with what you're doing and to watch the progress and get new ideas from you when it comes to arthritis and management in particular? Okay, so um, 
because arthritis is such a big problem and unfortunately there still is a very um there's a bit of a kind of apathetic attitude towards it oh it's just arthritis follow me on this one i'm hoping that we collectively can create a movement of change so the first thing is that we are not just there as an advisory service we're there to motivate and initiate change. So we have a hashtag called Your Dog More Years, and we're trying to get people to see benefits in joining us and spreading the love. So it's all about if I educate you, you educate someone else, they educate someone else, and we can actually initiate a really big change in understanding about pain expression and management. So you can always find me over on Cam. It's um, we have Facebook Lives every single week. So tonight I'm interviewing Professor Daniel Mills. This week it's Sarah Fisher. You know, I've got some really, Duncan Lascelles is coming back on. We have got people that are on the lecture circuit for the vet industry talking direct to the public. So that is huge. And that's a weekly event. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All of the lives that we do get transferred over to YouTube. So you have got a library of interviews with some seriously incredible people. So that's all great. We're just rebuilding our website that I'm really excited about mm-hmm. because that's just going to be, I've learned so much since I wrote it. I'm almost like, oh, what, just put it away. <laughs> I want to get a new one out. Um, with regards to learning more, we've got a course out called Cam Advocate Level 1. So Cam, Keen and Arthritis Management, you are the dog's advocate. And I won't lie, I put my heart into this. You will cry. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so many me go oh my god how have you managed to marry up emotion with education so you go on a journey with me throughout the course and I do want to make you cry because I want you to go home and remember this so that you bring it into all of your lines of work be you a dog walker be you a pet shop owner be you a kennel assistant it doesn't matter what you do in the canine industry this course will add to what service you provide um so that's come that's out now and it's in our education centre, which is www.cameducation.co.uk. We've got owner courses coming out. Um, it's quite a funny story. So I wrote the owner's course and then I got carried away on myself. And <laughs> I was recording it and suddenly I was talking for an hour instead of 15 minutes. I was like, damn it. <laughs> okay. Um, delete it. So that's going to be the comprehensive version. So if you if you want to have a comprehensive version, there's there's the long course <laughs> with loads of digital. But then I realised that a lot of people have busy lives. So um, I got myself a timer and I, I I cut it back and I re-recorded it. And there's the essentials one, which is 15 to 20 minutes per module. But it gives you this really broad overview of how you can manage your dog's condition. So they're coming out. And the thing that I'm really excited about, because I'm actually a child, as you can probably see. Um, <laughs> I mean, fun. Of course, with a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I know, still a child. <laughs> so there's a real trend online at the moment for people to um, get certificates for their dogs. So the trickster competition, you, the, the training, and the dog receives the certificate because the dog achieves. I was like, mm, we can play with this. So I'm going to do a course for the dog and the dog actually gets awarded the certificate. They've completed their health education. And it means that I get to be me instead of me being white coat Hannah, which I don't like being her. I actually like being this person. I get to talk to the dog about their weight problem. And I can talk to them in a really kind of like matter of fact, dude, you're carrying too much weight. You know, people in the park are going to start saying things. You better (laughs) shift some of these pounds. And I'm just hoping that that will be a way that we can lightheartedly really tackle some of these key issues without the owner being offended. So weight is always a bit of a taboo topic, um, but by changing who I'm talking to, we'll actually not have any blame culture added to it. So that's going to be coming out in the next few months as well. So we've got a lot going on. It's it's exciting. And when people say to me, are you not bored yet? I'm like, Nope, <laughs> no way, man. <laughs> this is a really, really area that we can actually really make massive change. That's wonderful. A lot of resources, especially if people are interested in learning more. I'm definitely going to be taking the CAM Advocate Level 1 course. I'm really, really interested to see what you've done with that. So 
I'll be signing up for that. And um, of course, you will cry. Yeah, I, I might have to wait a little while. I've had an emotional roller coaster lately, so I'm going to put that one off for the next couple of weeks. And then when I'm <laughs> feeling more sturdy, we'll tackle that one. <laughs> Maybe have it with a glass of wine. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yes. Yes. But yeah, thank you for all of those resources. This is, It's been absolutely lovely chatting with you. And I think um, for people that are really interested in learning more, you, you definitely have a starting board to spring off of to add some tools to the toolbox, to learn more, to get involved, especially from the community aspect. I love the community aspect that you're bringing to the table. So I highly encourage anyone that's listening to get involved with Holly's Army and check out the website. I will put all of the links in the description to the podcast below. So whether you're watching from YouTube or whether it's Apple iPod um, uh, podcasts or, or Spotify, um, all of that information will be in there so people can very easily find you directly and look into the courses and the Facebook page and all that good stuff. So Hannah, thank you so much for your time. Um, I've certainly learned a lot today, so I very much appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to enlighten us with all of your wonderful experience. Thank you. It's very nice to actually be interviewed. I'm normally the interviewer, so. <laughs> it's different, right, to be in the hot seat. <laughs> it's different. It's <laughs> different.